We're going live. Just thinking. You're live. Hey y'all, I'm James Wright and welcome to the shop. It is time for another Tuesday Live and if you haven't uh, seen these before, we do a live here on every Tuesday at 8 p.m. Central U.S. time. So come and have some fun with us. So if you are live tonight, we're basically going to be doing a Q&A, but I do want to be doing a few other things. We're going to be talking through several upcoming projects and showing you some of the things that are happening. Um, as well as talking about some other things we might be doing with live. Um, if you are not watching this uh, live, uh, if you go down in the description down below, I will have a list of all of the questions that have been asked so you can go through the questions and see which one you want. And there'll be a timestamp on there that gets you kind of close to where you want to be. Uh, so if you are here live and there's something particular you want to ask, go ahead and ask it. My wife will try and keep track of it. We'll get to as many as we can, but I can't always guarantee we will get to all of them. Uh, as there often are more questions than we can answer. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, we've got a lot of interesting things going on in the shop right now. Uh, I'm currently in the process of doing the next glue test, uh, which if you've been following the channel for a while, uh, it was March of last year, I did a glue test comparing 32 of the common glues one to another. Um, and I've seen a lot of other channels that will do a glue test, and they'll glue two boards together, and they'll squeeze them until something breaks. And they might do, you know, three tests of each glue or something of that nature. I want to do something that's far more scientific. And I would love to do 100 tests of every glue in every situation. Um, but I don't have enough time to do that. So what I'm going to end up doing is I'm doing 10 tests of each glue. Um, and I'm setting them up in a whole contraption with a load cell and uh, accurate measurement on there so that we can pressure them. And I'm trying to actually test the glue itself not the bond between the glue and the wood. So when they shear, I want to be able to shear it off at the glue line so that I can actually test the strength of the glue. Um, and we're testing it long grain to long grain. We're testing in grain to long grain. We are testing it outside in weather conditions and we're also testing it with gap filling. Um, so in all four of those situations, we'll be able to test those. Well, currently I'm doing another set of 32 glues. So we'll have a list of 64 glues total that we, we can compare this to. Um, and in this test, it's a lot of the other things uh, like construction adhesives and glues from Europe. And I have one glue from South America um, and a few other odds and ends things that, that we didn't get to last time. So it should be a, a really fun view. I have, I have a bunch of boards outside right now that are going through the freeze thaw cycle. Uh, so it'd be fun to test out. Um, but that's one I'm really looking forward to, and it's very exciting. My wife is pulling her hands up like, stop. Pause. Well, worth the effort just said, I think you're capturing sound from camera and not mic. Really? Hmm, let me take a look at that. It shouldn't be from the camera. The camera has no microphone on it. But I should be getting one from this. Uh. Hello there. Can you hear me? Yeah, I'm getting that. That's right, microphone. I don't know. Let me just do this. Yeah, no, it's getting the right microphone on there. So let me know if anything else pops up in it. Um, so yeah, I'm really looking forward to the glue test. So that should be coming up. I did a live video uh, last week or so where I was going through and, and testing a few of them, showing up the contraption. Uh, if you want to see more on that, if you go to the main channel, Wood by Right, and you type in the Great Glue Test, um, you can see what I did last year. Um, really interesting uh, results on that. Uh, and once I get all of these glues done, I actually want to do another test where I'm going to take like one of each of the main samples, so a PVA, uh, a CA, uh, construction adhesive, and put them out in the garage and actually test them every six months for like 20 years. Um, so we get a long-term test of glues. So I think that will be a, a fun one to play with. But yeah, that's coming up. That's been on my mind a lot. Um, any immediate questions before I jump into the next thing? Um, well, I have a couple. I Okay, so cool, you know. Cool, let's do one and then I'll talk about the next video. Okay, does it have to be a glue-related question? No. Okay, because. Yeah, yeah one great, but. Uh, I don't think I do at the moment. Okay. These are always the hard ones for me to keep up with. But PhotoSack81 <laughs> wants to know. So yeah, first question. How does James get videos out that um, he and his girlfriend have been privately discussing and not present for said conversations? Uh, I have a bunch of different methodologies. One is uh, ESP. Um, I also tap into all listening devices in houses throughout the world. So yeah. <laughs> 
No, I get that comment all the time where people are like, oh, I was just talking about that. So, yeah. <laughs> My wife oh. will tell you I don't read minds. <laughs> so here is one that people have been asking me to do whoa, 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 for... Oh, hang what's on. That? No, it's just lots of comments and I'm trying... Oh, can we do the thing like if you're going to ask a question, can you put like a bunch of question marks in the front or like... Yes question because or when the, big blue the chat is very active it's very hard for Sarah to always find them uh, this is one that people have been asking me to do for almost five years now this is my iron my branding iron that I use to to mark um, the uh, the boards and all and I made this up uh, back when wood by right was like a month or two old uh, so this is this is a very old thing for me and it's a, a 3D, 3D printed head and a really cheapo handle. Um, and people have been asking me, how do you make that? How do you make that? And I've been wanting to redo that. So I've decided to actually make a new one. I'm going to be making a bigger one. Um, and so I have a video coming out on how do you make this and how do you make a handle and make yourself your own branding iron um, for a total price of like uh, 13 bucks. Uh, actually, I think this one in this large size was like $18. This one was like uh, $12, $13. Um, so it's a, a very, very cheap thing to make. But this will be a fun one that a lot of people have been asking for. What's the next question? Okay, I have a glue question that just popped up. Cool. Because I have no idea what you're talking about right this second because I'm reading the comments. Um, Steven Deswan wants to know, how about testing hide glue as well? Yes. Um, in the initial list, um, I was testing six different hide glues. Um, I tested one that I made myself, um, as well as several other brands, and the liquid high glue and the tight bond high glue. Um, so there's a whole pile in there. In this new one, I'm also testing fish glue. I'm testing a German high glue. Um, so most all of the common glues were in the another the initial test. So go on YouTube and search for the Great Glue Test, and you will you will find all that information on there. Um, very interesting. High glue is one of those things that was, was slightly surprising. So, yeah. The, the other one that was really good was uh, 2P10 Super Glue. Uh, that one was very surprising. Um, I'm looking forward to, uh, to playing with that one a bit more. So, uh, <coughs> next video I have coming out, I've had a lot of people asking about plane restoration. And I have a pile of videos on plane restoration. Um, and, and going through a bunch of things. But I wanted to do one where I get as close as possible to taking the plane back to looking like new, but a total strip down. And so for this one I have, uh, this is a, um, oh, come on, uh, Ohio Tools, um, number five. And uh, this one was in really, really bad shape. Handle busted and a lot of things like that. And I'm actually going back and doing all of the Japan work on this. So uh, this one I just pulled out of the oven have a brand new coat of Japaning on there. Um, and we'll be reworking the handles and basically making it look just like new. Um, so this will be a whole new flattening work on the bottom of this. So I'm really, really looking forward to, to showing off this. We'll be going into the detail on all of the setup of it. And uh, yeah, this one's gonna look really pretty. <laughs> uh, but I will be talking more about Japaning work um, and if you want to see really good information on Japaning, go to, um, oh, come on, Hand, uh, Hand Tool Rescue. Um, he's a, a YouTube channel um, up in Canada, and he has, I guess, 50-minute long video on different methods of Japaning that is phenomenal. Uh, I'm actually planning on going up to his place, um, doing a collaboration here, uh, December, January, somewhere in that range, uh, where we're going to be restoring... Uh, my, uh, my new lathe. I got a uh, Barnes foot powered number five. It's actually a metal lathe, uh, but I'll be doing some metal work and turning uh, and wood turning on it as well. Uh, but it is a really, really, really cool old lathe I've been wanting to do for a while. What's the next question? Okay, hang on. Um, I have card. okay. I have no clue. Well, I don't know what you're talking about right now. So I'm just going to the next fine. question, Mr. Q. If your bow saw or turning Oh, I think it's are your bow saws or turning saws collapsible? I'm moving internationally and I'm considering making some to keep in a toolbox while I'm there. Yeah, yeah, they're, uh, so this is the turning saw I made a while ago. 
Um, actually, I made this one in a live series, so we went through this step by step in lives. Um, and yeah, you take the string off it, the whole thing just falls apart, and it's just ten ends into the out, into the ends. Um, so same thing with uh, with all my you know frame saws and bow saws. They're just held together with the tension. You take the tension off, and you can take all the pieces out and pull apart. Um, so yeah, they're all collapsible tools. One of the things that I love about a good uh, frame saw or bow saw is that you can easily break them down and travel with them. Um, so if I do need to go anywhere, that's very useful. Let's see. Oh yeah, this is the uh, Japaning that I made up for this. Um, yeah. So if you want to see the mixtures for this, go and look at the hand tool rescue. Um, oh, another video I have coming up as I made the veneer press. Can I just say how much that Japaning stinks when it's cooking in your oven? <laughs> <laughs> I tried to do it when you're gone, but... <laughs> just the warning! Yeah, if you're going to be cooking Japaning, uh, you might want to get a different oven. Or warn your spouse. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I made this uh, veneer press in a video recently. And one of the reasons I want to make this is I want to make my own plywood. Um, <laughs> And so I've got a video coming up where I'm literally taking a log. So I have a log that I'm slicing up and I'm turning the log into veneer, then taking that veneer and using the press and making really high grade plywood. So this is eighth inch thick plywood, white oak, all the layers are white oak. It is a seven ply solid white oak plywood. Um, so you, you really can't buy that in the store, but I'm making it from the log itself. And the reason I want to do this is I actually want to make a clock, a wooden gear clock, which to keep the stability, you really need something, uh, you, you need plywood. And so I want to get really, really high grade plywood. And the best way to do that is make it yourself. So we've got a video coming out here soon, making uh, veneer, well, cutting the veneer from the log, turning it into plywood, and then we'll be cutting this into gears so it should be a fun video of, well, we'll have a video on how do you cut veneer with a handsaw. And then we'll have a video about how do you make plywood. But then we'll have a total video where we'll take it from the log to a functioning clock hanging on the wall completely with hand tools. Uh, I think that'll be a really, really fun series. <laughs> What's next? Uh, let's see. Oh, I'm going to totally get this name wrong. Attila Taruk? I have no idea. Hey, I'm getting set up my first ever hand tool woodworking workshop. It's a one car garage in an urban area. I can't use anything too loud or dusty. Any ideas about a good beginner setup? Thanks. That's where hand tools really, really shine. Uh, the reason I got into hand tools is my initial shop space uh, was, it was a just over 10 foot by 10 foot. Um, tiny little space and I was in the basement and so I'm a stay-at-home dad, and I want something I can do while the kids are napping. Um, and so hand tools are phenomenal for that. They're pretty much just about anything you're doing other than you know really heavy pounding um, and, and chisel chopping, you can, you can generally do without anyone hearing you through the walls or ceiling. Um, and so, yes, hand tools are, are great for that. Um, as also inside, you're not making a lot of dust, so you're not really tracking that throughout the house like you are with a normal wood shop. Um, so it's it's quiet. It's it's safe to have for the kids around. It's just yeah, it works out really well. Um, I do have an entire video on the main channel where I go through beginner's tools. I had thought about doing a live on that sometime here where I actually go through what do you need. Um, but like I started out with a set of chisels that I got from Harbor Freight. Um, I had a number four plane, and I had a handsaw, a plastic handsaw that I got from. Uh, the big box store and all told I spent $12 on my first set of tools um, and from then on either I made the tool I needed or I went out and purchased it when I needed that particular tool and so you use that to then build your first bench that is your your first main project but you usually end up making a few things in order to make the bench such as I made a few clamps to make the bench uh, well in order to make the clamps I had to make uh, there was some jig that I had to make in order to make the the clamps and then I made winding sticks and I made a few other things. Um, and so you just, you go through the list of what do I need to make the bench. And as you come to the next step, you figure out how do you either make that or do you go out and buy that. Um, and once you've made a bench, then you have the main tool you need for the shop. 
Um, and from that point on, you know, the world is your oyster. Have fun. Um, you don't really need to dive into getting all the tools. Most of the tools I have, I've purchased because I want to show a video on them. Um, but most of the time, I, I suggest people only buy tools when they need it for a specific job. Um, don't go and buy the tool because you want the tool. Um, pick your project and then buy the tool that you need to make the project. Um, and okay. Most of the time, you don't need all of those. What's that? Arthur Turner says we're both out of focus. Uh, I'm pretty sure I've focused that one. Let me check that. It might be a low feed, in which case you get bit rate. Um, so it doesn't look like it's in focus, but it's just the, the low feed. If we're both out of focus, then it's the low feed. Um, oh, 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 this project, this is one I've been, this project I've been working on for over a year. This is um, a bench that I'm making, and uh, uh, I'm actually shooting the footage for this out in the woods. And so what I'm gonna be doing is walking into the woods with this half inch chisel, and where's my leather strop? This leather strop, and that is all I'm using to chop a tree down and make a stool. And this will be a four-legged stool, um, and I'm, uh, I'm doing the last, hopefully shooting the last footage on this tomorrow. Um, so an entire project from literal tree to stool using a half-inch chisel. Uh, so this will be a very interesting one. This is, a, this is the box elder with the red flares in it. Um, I'm really liking how this is coming out. So, Got a little bit more to do on this video, uh, but that one, it, we, we actually started this in October last year. Um, and then the snow started to fly and we couldn't shoot footage outside. And then we, had, we were going to do it in the spring again, but then we thought the footage would look kind of odd, so we waited again until the fall to shoot the rest of it for this. So yes, do you need anything more than a half inch chisel? No, you can do it all with a half inch chisel, but um, other tools make things a lot easier. <laughs> what, what's the next question? Uh, Worth the Effort says, who's doing your videography work nowadays? Lots of, lots of stuff looks handheld. Yes, um, Luke Milkey, uh, he owns uh, Fusion Videos. Uh, he's a friend of mine from college. Uh, when I used to work up there, he, he worked for me on stage. Uh, he actually has his own uh, videography business and uh, has, uh, he, he comes down once, usually once every other week and I try to get all these projects ready so that I have the next step ready and he can come and I can shoot a whole bunch of things in one day. Um, and so I do a lot of things off footage um, so that when he comes we can actually get all these videos. That's why he's coming tomorrow. Um, so I'm getting all these projects ready so he can come and we can shoot the next step on doing the planes. There's just a lot of things where a glue up has to set overnight, and so we can't do it all in one day because we'll, we'll have all of these in different steps. Um, so that is, um, yeah, um, Luke Milky Fusion Videos. And so he brings down like $10,000 in video equipment, and uh, um, he's, he, he's phenomenal at it. Um, he's now also helping me do some of the editing. Um, up until just like a couple videos ago, I was doing all the editing. He was just shooting the footage and giving it to me. Um, but now he's doing a little bit more of the editing. So he's doing like most of the, the artistic videos, the, the main chunk of video. He mixes that together. And then I add the music and put in the intro outro on it. Um, so it's a, it's a fun, fun thing. Um, let's see. Oh, okay. I got to show you this. This is, this is a fun one. Uh, we are actually, I have these down in the shop now, is I have these two massive slabs. Um, focus, there we go. So these are uh, currently about 10 foot long, and these are the same red oak that I made the table out of, um, so the, uh, from the exact same tree. And we're gonna be turning these into two different desks. One of them goes upstairs, and the other one goes over here where Sarah's at. Oop, camera's in um, so the idea is to have a desk that is long enough so two people can work side by side up there. And then the other one will be a desk upstairs for the kids to do all of their homework on. So we'll have desks that then match the, uh, the table that is upstairs. So that is, uh, that's coming up in a little while. Uh, though I'm seasoning this wood um, because these have been sitting outside for uh, almost five years at Matt Cremona's place. Um, so I'm bringing them down here to fully acclimate and they're gonna be in the shop for mm, probably another month or so. 
uh, and then we can start actually planning them down and, uh, and shaping them. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to that. What's next? <clears throat> Let's see, Dwayne Rogers. Question about sweep on gouges. I know it's the curve on a gouge, but what does the number mean? Is it a radius or some archaic measurement? Um, theoretically, the sweep is a specific measurement, um, but most companies out there have a different measurement for what that number means. And everyone is going to tell you, no, this is the standard way of doing it. But then this other company says, no, this is the standard way of doing it. And then they say, no, this is the standard way of doing it. Um, and so, yeah, I, I, I <laughs> you, you end up digging yourself into a hole anytime you say that the, the number on the sweep means this. Um, basically, it's a way that, you know, if you go to two cherries and uh, you look at theirs and you see it's number six, um, then you'll know that the number eight is, is bigger and the number 12 is bigger than that. Um, so you, uh, you can compare it in a company, but if you go company to company, um, there are a couple of them that are the same. If I remember correctly, two cherries and file, file pile, whatever you can say it. Um, I, if I remember correctly, those two use the same system, but a lot of other companies use a completely different system for actually measuring that, that uh, sweep on them. So, yeah, <laughs> um, no, there is no right answer to that one, sorry. What's next? Uh, let's see. The Mayflower Pilgrim wants to know, have you ever been to Perham? 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 I don't think I've I have been no to idea. We need context. <laughs> What's next? Um, let's see. Photozac81 Snow. If you build a power tool by hand, think build your own table saw, band saw, scroll saw, would you say it is keeping, is it in keeping with the hand tool shop's ethic, considering it? Okay, um, first I have to preface this by saying the reason I do hand tools is not because I want to be historically accurate. Uh, the reason I do hand tools is not because I want to build the shop myself. Uh, the reason I do hand tools is because I find them to be fun. Uh, now that being said, if I didn't have a hand tool only channel, I would have a few power tools in the shop because there are steps where, uh, you know, ripping 70 feet of two inch thick red oak is, it, it loses its fun after about 60 feet. <laughs> so it would be nice you know, to grab a circular saw and go to town. But because I have an all hand tools channel, I'll cut it all by hand. Um, and so if your thing is you enjoy making power tools, then have fun at it. Um, I don't, there's, there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. It's a great thing. Um, if I wasn't, didn't have a channel, I would have a solidly hybrid shop. I mean, I do have a table saw, I have a band saw, I have um, quite, I have a power planner. Um, they're up in the garage, and I, I don't generally use them for uh, projects unless I, I show, you know, I'm using it for this. Um, like I was using the, uh, the, uh, um, I was making the press, and I had to put in three-inch screws, and so yeah, I can run in a three-inch screw by hand, but I've got a power drill right there, um, so I did that, and I, I put it in the video showing yes, I am using a power tool here, um, but. Yeah, I, everyone's gonna have a different thing because, like, I use I have a foot powered scroll saw here. I have a foot powered lathe. I have a couple foot powered lathes now. Um, I, I use a vacuum press. I mean, there's other things like that that I bring in power. I have a uh, I have a, a, a power hand planer that I use from time to time in videos. Um, there's other things like that that I, I use electrical tools. There's nothing wrong with that. It's just that's what I do. So you have to find out, you know, where do you want to put the line on your shop, and that's up to you. Um, and some people, why have a line? Great, don't have a line. Um, that's just where I prefer to have it. Where do I have fun in the shop? And that's what I want to spend my time on. I don't want to find. I don't want to pick the tool that's the fastest. I don't want to pick the tool that is the most accurate. I want to pick the tool that is the most fun for me. And sometimes that is a very twisted thing because I am an ultra runner. I like to do those crazy dumb things that other people think are incredibly hard, but I find that to be incredibly fun. So that's where I. 
I do things. Why are you looking at me that way, babe? Do you want me to comment? There's a reason I married you. Oh, I'm in the doghouse. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, and you're following that up with... Chocolate! Do it from a safe distance. <laughs> no, here, no. My arm's not that good. <laughs> well, that and <laughs> far more expensive than that, right? <laughs> no, your arm sucks. <laughs> What's next? I'm sorry, you guys have never seen James throw a baseball. <laughs> it's a scary sight. Um, <laughs> sorry, I think about other things. Jeff Osborne wants to know, did you figure out what you're doing with the leather circle scraps? Oh, yeah, no, I've got, uh, uh, I've got, well, here, let me grab them. Uh, they've got, like, uh, almost 200 of these things now. And I've been thinking about what I want to do with them. And they're eh, about the size of a half dollar. I think they're an inch and a quarter in diameter. Um, they're, they're scraps left over from the horse butt strops. Um, so I make strops and sell them on my website if you haven't seen those before. Um, and I'm always ending up with a pile of scrap that I just don't know what to do with. And most of the pieces are just too small. So I thought I would cut these coins out. Um, and I'm thinking I'm gonna, brand a bun I'm gonna brand them all. And some of them will be um, will be maker coins that I can I can trade with people. And some of them I'm thinking about drilling a hole through them and turning them into keychains. Um, and I thought about possibly doing like a Christmas ornament as well, um, or having little giveaway items. So yeah, I've got an entire box of of uh, like a hundred and almost two hundred of these things. Um, <laughs> so if you have any fun ideas, um, there there were a pile of ideas as I put them up on the. Uh, the Wood by Right Hive Mind group. Um, I think I put them up on the Instagram too. Uh, so if you think, oh yeah, yeah, you should do that with it, let me know. But I'm probably going to be turning them into coins that I either send with shipments when th when people buy them from me, or uh, um, sell keychains with the Wood by Right logo. So I actually I made them to the size I can put the the brand and then brand in the logo on them. Um, so one of the fun things I'm playing with. What's next? Sorry, they asked about Chia Bob, and I said Chia Bob became moldy and died. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Chia Bob died a most horrific death. He was doing so good, and then... No. <laughs> All right, back to questions. Jerome Cornette wants to know, benefits slash drawback of a low versus high hand plane front knob parentheses old versus newer Stanley bench planes. Uh, I believe you're meaning high angle versus low angle plane. Um, that is one I have several videos on. I actually just had a video on this channel. I've got two or three on the main wood by right channel. Um, there are pros and cons to them. Is one better than the other? No. Um, the low angle plane is great on in grain. The high angle plane is great on your, your figured grain, your wild grain. Um, neither plane is like the best overall. Um, anytime you try and make a plane that can do everything, it might be able to functionally do everything, but it is never great at everything. Um, and so that's one of the reasons why a lot of people then have a lot of different planes because each one has a spot that it is very good at. Okay, we got clarification. What's that? He means the height of the front knob, not the angle. Oh, okay, you're talking about antique and uh, flattened. Let me grab, uh, where is it? A good low, here we are. Yes, um, um, Stanley went through a whole bunch of different designs on knob height. And here, let me zoom in on these. Focus, there we go. And they changed a bunch of things over time and then they gave options. Um, some of the older ones have much taller, um, narrower knobs and then they got um, flatter. Um, and what's the older ones? Um, maybe it's the other way around. They, were, they used to be this and then they became higher. I'm at a loss for words on which one it was. Someone will correct me here. Um, but different people really love this style and different people really love this style. Um, and then you have the Veritas combination oh, plane that comes in and they actually offer the front knob in several different styles. Um, and so on this one I chose the, the, the tall size 
And I wish I would have gone for the medium one instead. This is just a little bit too high. Everyone's got something a little bit different. Um, I generally, if I'm using a, uh, um, if I'm using a, a jointer plane, I'm generally grabbing the, the edge of the plane. I'm not going to be grabbing the mouth because I'm going to be using my, my finger as a fence and running along it. So the knob on a jointer, I generally don't grab the knob. Um, on a hand on a, uh, a smoothing plane, I'm often going to be grabbing it down here, in which case a taller knob kind of gets this bump out of the way and I can grab it down close to the bottom and I can be more detailed across it. When I'm grabbing a jack plane, then I've got the knob on top and I like this squashed knob that I can just grab the top and run across it. Um, so different strokes for different folks. Everyone has something slightly different that they like and in the end it really comes down to a personal preference. Um, but it's one of those things you'll never know until you try and you'll never try until you own all of them. So <laughs> buy them all and then you can sell off the ones you don't want. What's next? Okay, so we got clarification on the question Mayflower Pilgrim asked about going to Perham. And it was Turtle Fest near Detroit Lakes. I mean never anything. Heard of it. We know nothing. Send me information. Sounds like fun. Turtle. Sorry. <laughs> Going to be the master of disguise. <laughs> There's a movie that we really like. Master of Disguise. It's cute. You should watch it. Anyways. Uh, Holes Clut wants to know. Hi, question. To making a clean hole with an auger. I have a couple of augers with... It says knicker, but I think it's nicks facing away from the workpiece and cannot get them sharpened to make the clean hole. Yes, that the knicker or the spur. Um, ah. It uh, most. Oh, here we grab this. Most. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Most augers have the spur going um, down toward the work. I'm sorry, I'm out of focus. Focus. There we go. And so you can see the spurs are sticking forward here so that they, these will actually cut the circle before the blade comes in and removes the material in between the snail and the spur. Um, and uh, th the reason they're sticking out this way is so you, you get a really nice clean rim as this goes around and it will actually slice the circle. Um, on some, the spur sticks back up this way uh, and that will give you a cleaner cut inside but will give you a, a poor entry wound. Um, and those are very, very common for your timber framing um, bits. Actually, let's see if I have one of those in here. Let's switch back over to this camera. Let's see if I've got my... Uh, no. Uh, you go over here. Sorry, off camera looking for things. Um, Pretty sure I have one of those. I don't use them much because they're usually they were very commonly used for uh, timber framing, which I haven't done much with. No, I don't know where those are at. Um, but the spur, rather than sticking down into the work, um, sticks up along the blade, and so that will actually clean the inside, um, so you have less uh, less fuzzies sticking into the joint. Um, but it won't cut that perfect circle, so your beginning entry wound. Um, will often, uh, um, you'll get a lot of tear out sticking out the sides. So, yes, if you want the clean cut, you need a different type of auger bit. So. That's why these are probably the most common where the, uh, the spurs stick up. Yeah. What's next? Uh, let's see. Travis Reese says, I'm making a countertop for a local coffee shop from some white oak cut from my yard. The top needs epoxy for restaurant use. Do you need epoxy to bottom? Do you need to epoxy the bottom as well as the top? Um, you probably don't need to epoxy it, um, but you do need to finish it so that it, you don't get a lot of airflow to the bottom. Um, if you leave it raw, uh, what will happen is moisture will come in the bottom and the bottom of the table will expand and you'll get it cupping. And so you'll actually end up, the, the surface will be cupping up. Um, and so if it were me, I would probably epoxy it all the way around, seal it the same way so you have the same amount of airflow coming from all sides. Um, I, 
if, if I had the money and the work, I would use a penetrating epoxy on the bottom, so you'd still get that smooth wood surface. You, you have the, oh. the texture feeling of wood, and then have the bar top epoxy that covers the top and sides. Uh, but yes, you do want to seal it all the way around with one thing or another. Um, even if you just hit it with uh, some poly um, and, uh, and sealed it that way so you would have less air movement coming in from the bottom. Um, that way it's not getting a differential moisture level on the bottom of the wood as the top of the wood. So, yeah. What's next? Oh, Blue Kestrel wanted to know, does Japaning only come in black? <laughs> um, Yes and no. The reason it's black is one of the main um, ingredients in it is black, um, asphaltum. Um, so, bless you. What's that? Bless you. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, so, yes, I guess you could use a powder of some other substance. Um, but the reason it's black is because its main ingredient is black. Um, so, yeah. If, if you wanted something else, use an acrylic paint. Um, you can get stuff that's pretty darn close as, 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 as durable or even like a powder coating, um, just as durable as, as Japaning would be. Um, so, yeah. That, that's what I would do is an acrylic, uh, um, enamel, not acrylic. <laughs> um, like it, an enamel engine block paint, you can get any color you want and uh, will be just about as durable. What's next? So, Can Do says, hi, James, and hi. Quest question, I get this one a lot, how's it going? Good. <laughs> he didn't ask me. <laughs> well, even though I am on YouTube, I am a man of few words in person. I'm not the average people person. person. <laughs> What's next? No. So it's tools or all right let's see the poor man asks is it okay to refer someone to you if they ask me a question i can't answer with a certainty sure yeah if i get if i get emails i i try and answer every email i get oh my uh, gosh it, it dings all late, night long but what's that i said it dings all night long <laughs> <laughs> he'll answer what's next She's going choo, 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 choo. I'm just making sure I'm not missing. Okay. Blink three times if you're... <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I'm not going to tell you why I'm laughing. Um, I have to go back and read the comments. <laughs> Leonard Davis asks, Do you use different types of glue on different types of wood? Um, generally, no. Um, some people will tell you if you're working with a really oily wood, um, you know, some of the, the South American hardwoods like, uh, uh, or things like rosewood, um, then you should use an epoxy uh, or something of that nature. And I, I haven't found a real difference in that. Um, so generally, no. Um, in most all applications, I'm using a Type Bond 2 um, PVA. It is much, much stronger than the wood in almost all applications. Um, the, the, it's usually application, not wood type, that determines what glue I use. If it's going outside, I'm using epoxy. Um, in the tests I've done, nothing stands up anywhere near to what epoxy does outside. Um, even the, the tight bond waterproof, I, no, it falls apart in the water. Um, it, it, it does not hold its strength under constant moisture. Um, so, no, I, I don't use that out there. Um, if it's something small and quick and delicate, I use super glue. It works great. It's very fast, it's simple, um, and yeah, it holds really, really well. So, uh, different glues for different applications, not as much for different types of wood. What's next? Michael Heemstra asks, is there a difference between wood and metal files? What's the difference between quality of files? Are the premium brands worth it? How to tell if they're dull and what to look for when buying antique? Wow, that was like five questions. <laughs> so uh, I think that's about it for the rest of these. <laughs> um, you are going to have people who tell you, ooh, that's a metal file and ooh, that's a wood file. 
throw it out the window. They're both files. They will both work, work fine. If you have a particular wood file, it may mean that it's slightly softer, in which case you probably don't want to use it on metal. Uh, but if you have a metal file, it will work perfectly fine on wood. Um, don't worry about that. Um, one of the big differences are floats. Um, let me grab. Where did you go? Where's my float? It floated away. Oops, there we go. A float and a file. Let's grab this one. Ooh, let's grab a rasp and show that as well. Um, so a file. Let's switch back over to this camera here. Um, a file has grooves going all the way across the blade. All the way across the plate. Focus. There we go. And so here you can see, let me grab this point, uh, these grooves going all the way across in a, in a crisscross pattern. That's a file. Uh, whether they're going in a crisscross or they're just going across in the same pattern, uh, that's a file. A float has a solid groove, usually much larger, that go all the way across in one pattern. Um, in this case, they are curved, uh, but most of the time they will just go straight across. But they're these large tooth. Looking at from the side, it looks like a saw blade, uh, whereas a file uh, will generally have them going at an angle or they'll be crisscrossing. And then you have a rasp. Um, a rasp has all these tiny little teeth, and so actually each one of these have been notched in either by hand or in this case by machine. Um, and so that's, that's the big difference between them. Uh, some floats are actually made soft enough so you can reshape it, you can resharpen them with a file. Um, and so they, they dull faster, but you can constantly resharpen them. Uh, files, you cannot resharpen a file. You will, have, you will have videos that say, ooh, you can resharpen it with acid. You're not sharpening it, you're cleaning it. And once they have been dulled, um, you have to anneal them and remake them and then reharden them. Um, you can't actually sharpen a file. Um, now, as to a quality of files, do you have to get the good ones or can you buy the cheap ones? Uh, for the most sake, no. Uh, what I generally tell people is go to estate sales or places like that where you've had woodworkers or metal workers and you will find in their basement all of their old tools and there will be a bucket of files and rasps and a collection of them. And once you buy two or three of those collections, you will have all the files or rasps you need for a long, long time. Um, and many of them are, are older and not so good or they're getting dull. Um, and you can sort through them and pick the ones you want and then throw the other ones away. Um, and so that's usually the way I, way I tell people to do. With, um, with rasps, on the other hand, there are machine stitched rasps like this one. And the problem with machine stitched rasp is they, they tend to create a, a rhythm. And so one tooth cuts, next tooth cuts, next tooth cuts, and they'll get into a specific vibration or get them going duh, 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 right across the wood. Um, but you can get hand stitch rasps that um, the, well, the hand stitching makes it so that every point is in a slightly different place. Um, and so that eliminates the vibration, so there is no um, constant vibration going through it. Um, so some people really say that getting a hand stitch rasp is well worth it. Uh, I have one little one, and I really haven't noticed a huge difference for it. I, rather than having the file going straight across the wood, I cant it at a slight angle, um, and that eliminates the vibration, so I don't have to worry about that as much. Um, is it really worth buying a $100 hand stitch rasp as opposed to buying a $30 machine stitch rasp? If you have the money, maybe. Um, for me, no. Um, but, yeah. Um, as to most things, if you are going to be using the file for a specific job over and over and over again, like I have for all of my saw sharpening files, uh, in that case, I, I generally buy a good one. And these ones, the ones I use are from, um, I buy them from um, Lee Valley, and they're Baco files. Um, very good name file and they will last longer. That being said, can you go to the big box store and buy the right file there? Sure. Will it last as long? No. Uh, but it's crazy cheap in comparison. One of these files is like 30 bucks. One of those files from the big box store is five bucks. So per money and how many sharpenings you get out of it, you're actually cheaper 
to go to the big box store and buy a bunch of the cheap ones and just when they wear out you throw them away. How do you know how sharp they are? Experience. <laughs> if, if they aren't cutting as fast as they're supposed to be, that probably means they're dull. Um, how do you know that? Experience. Um, there really isn't a good way to tell other than I, I, I can feel it over time. If, it's, if, I, if I'm sliding it over my finger, fingers and I'm, I'm feeling it catching, I feel it being sharp, um, then it's pretty good. Uh, with rasps and sometimes files, if you get up close to the neck, um, these teeth right up here don't get used very often. And so if you feel those teeth, uh, that's that's what sharp-ish should feel like, and so if you come out here where you use them a little bit, and it'll it'll feel duller. Um, so that's why you can feel the difference between what is probably sharp and what is been used a good bit more. Um, but other than that, experience is pretty much the only way to know um, if it is dull or not. Um, I think that answers all the aspects of those questions. There are a lot of topics, and one of these days I'll probably do a video dedicated to rasps and files. I want to get a couple more. I want to get a, a couple other hand stitch files before uh, rasp before I do that. Um, but that could end up being several videos because there are so many different topics and everyone's going to say something different on those. A whole lot of personal opinion goes into that. What's next? Let's see. Jacob Meadows wants to know what are traditional methods of attaching tabletops without screws or nails? <laughs> the traditional method for attaching a tabletop is a screw or a nail. <laughs> I, I, it, it, it grates at anyone who is new and getting into woodworking. They want to have all this all wooden joinery. Um, but to be honest, the tabletop expands and contracts with the grain and it will expand and contract um, if you don't have any air conditioning in your house, it will expand and contract rather greatly. If you have air conditioning in your house, it won't expand and contract that much. Um, and so the, the old traditional method is to pocket hole the top on. Yes, I said that. Pocket hole the top on. Because that will allow expansion and contraction of the top. It is a traditional method. and It is hundreds and hundreds of years old. Um, so yes, there is nothing wrong with putting a screw in. Um, another common way is to create a toggle, and so you cut a groove into your skirt, and the toggle then goes into that groove, and then you run a screw through the toggle into the top. Um, the only real solid way to do it without any hardware is sliding dovetails. Um, and if you want to see a video on that, I actually did a series. I made a side table, um, and I actually attached the top with sliding dovetails. And it works out really well, but you have to make very long, detailed sliding dovetails, and that can really scare people. Um, but the sliding dovetail then will allow the top to expand and contract and still continue to slide along those dovetails while still providing the strength to hold it down. But if you're making a big table, that means you have to cut a you know, 36 inch long sliding dovetail. Um, and that really scares a lot of people. But yes, the historical method is to use screws. <laughs> okay. I'm at this point, I'm going to say that if I haven't captured the question, it probably isn't going to get answered. Cool. But we will see. Unless you put up a super chat, then we'll, we'll jump straight to your question. This is true. That being said, Sarah has a good joke she was wanting to say. I do have a couple of good jokes. <laughs> Should we pause? <laughs> Hang on. I got to pull it up. What's that? I got I got one. Hang on. Oh, oh, she has to look up her joke. I have to get, yeah. She doesn't memorize them like I do. You know what? <laughs> <laughs> oh, where did it go? Hang on. We're expecting such a cold winter. The squirrels are collecting more nuts than usual. So far, three of my relatives have disappeared. I love that one. Yeah. You didn't like that one? No, that's, uh, that's too close to home. <laughs> well, we didn't say which side of the family. <laughs> <laughs> anyways. Anyways, anyways. What's next? Oh, uh, James had a power move. What was your power move? Anyways. Uh, Joe R. says, what is your favorite tool you own and what is the tool you would most like to get? Uh, my favorite tool is the one I happen to be using at the time. Um, in all honesty, if I'm having fun with the shop, I'm having fun with a particular tool at a time. 
And my favorite tool is something that is always changing because there's, there's always something new I get or something fun that is intriguing me or um, anytime I get to use my big frame saw, it's, it's enjoyable. I'm looking forward to spending about an hour tomorrow with the frame saw doing some resawing. Um, yes, I'm looking forward to an hour of resawing by hand. <laughs> um, but if I have to say anything, it's the, the half-inch chisel because it is probably the most versatile tool in the shop. If you get skilled, you can do pretty much anything with a half-inch chisel. You can smooth a board with a half-inch chisel. Um, you can cut down a tree with a half-inch chisel. Um, it's just how much time do you want to spend? So, yeah, that's that. that. Um, future tool? Um, you know, honestly, people are asking me that all the time. Is what, what's the, uh, you know, you're going to a tool meet. Who are you looking for anything special? Most of the time, no. Um, and I tend to look at tools very differently from most people. Is that I look at tools from the standpoint of, um, could I make a video out of that? Um, as opposed to, ooh, this is a fun tool. Um, so... Okay, so money's no object. What's the tool you want? Um, probably the Veritas um, custom plane. I would like to get a, a jointer. Um, well, I'd like to get the whole set of Veritas custom planes. This is just, it's, it is by far my absolute favorite plane. It is incredible. Um, but it is incredibly expensive. So, yes, if you've got the money, that's the one I would go with. But, you know, 400 to 500 bucks a piece, you need the money. <laughs> I thought you were going to say Stanley number one. Oh, uh, yes, there's a Stanley number one. Yes, I need a good Stanley number one someday. Yes, yeah, see. Mm -hmm. a pit saw. I, Ooh, a pit saw would be nice. Oh, uh, see, see, you just got to get you talking. And then, <laughs> um, let's see. Photo Zach anyone says, related to the high knob, low knob question from earlier. Can these be swapped, or is it a plane design thing? Um, in most pa most places, they were designed, this particular type of Stanley had this particular size knob. Uh, now, the old ones didn't have a ring around them, and so theoretically, you can switch the knobs um, from one to another. Um, on the, I want to say it was around type 9, they started creating a ring that kind of housed the bottom of the knob. And so if the bottom of your knob is the wrong size, it won't fit on that ring. Um, but in most cases, I think they're all pretty close to size. So I really haven't tried switching them out. Um, I just haven't, I haven't noticed enough difference between them to say, ooh, I really want this knob on that plane. So, yeah. What's next? <sighs> O'Neill Flynn says, are you going to do any more limited tool builds? Yes. This one, which we talked about earlier. <laughs> I'm using a half inch chisel to cut down a tree and to make a stool out of. Um, so an entire project from tree to finished project using just a half inch chisel. Limited tools enough for you? I know. The next thing is I'm going to go into the woods and I'm going to nap my own stone and I'm going to cut down a tree and I'm going to build a 16th century inlaid panel high boy using napped tools that I dug out of the ground with my own teeth. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, really, all of my projects are limited tools because I only use hand tools. So, yeah, no, that's one of those fun rabbit holes to go down to. At what point is a limited tools project? Um, because everyone has a different line for limited tools. So, yeah. <laughs> What's next? Let's see. Greg Cheng says, sorry I'm late. Can you sharpen the threaded point on an auger bit? Yes. Yes, you can. Um, you get a, a small needle file, um, and you get just a, a, a triangular needle file, and you can go in and reshape those. Um, so what happens a lot of times is the very tip snaps off, and that very tip of the auger file is the most important, the very tip of the auger is the most important on the entire thing. Um, if, if the tip isn't there, it's not going to be biting into the wood and that, that snail is what pulls this whole thing through the wood. You putting force on it uh, is the wrong thing. This should do all the work for you. You just need to turn it and it will pull itself through the wood. Um, but that can only happen if that tip is on there. And so yes, reshaping it can be done once maybe twice probably not um, and so yeah 
You, you generally don't need to sharpen them unless, you, unless you've broken that. What's next? Uh, let's see. Hang on. Tom Ingalls asks, what is the three button switch behind you? <laughs> this is my pickle. Uh, this is a control pickle. Uh, my, uh, my, my master's work was in uh, technical theater, and which is basically automation and control for the theater. And uh, so I, I'm, I have a, a gearhead for special effects in the theater, and that is a, a holdover from that, where I had that for several projects. Um, so this was the go button, the stop button, and the reverse button for a, a turntable that I made a long time ago. Um, and so it is just there for decoration. It is a piece of my history and uh, something fun. But I get the question all the time. It's just there for fun and looks and to make people ask, what's that there for? Like a lot of things in my life. Not going to say it. <laughs> <laughs> I love you. Don't look at me that way. <laughs> I get asked that question too. <laughs> Mr. Q asks, are we ever going to see a pink painted plane over your blue version? <laughs> I, I do want to do that someday. I, you know, I think if, if I ever get a number one, I'm going to strip it down and I'm going to paint it blue, which is going to scream. I, so many people are going to be yelling at me for doing that. Um, but if it's my plane, I'm going to do whatever I want to do with it. Um, but yeah, I probably will paint some plain, plain bright pink. I actually have a block plane that I'm restoring here soon. I might do that. That'd be kind of funny. You're going to paint it pink just because you're destroying it? Got to get a plane for Melody. So. <laughs> Make a set of tools, my daughter. <laughs> What's next? <laughs> it's funny how many times you've ended up in the doghouse in the comments tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Brian Weber asked, if you did not have a hand tool YouTube channel, would you be back using power tools? I, I would have a, a solidly hybrid uh, hybrid uh, shop. Um, a table saw, a jointer, a band saw, a planer. Um, and power tools are great for doing anytime you need to do a lot of something. Um, so anytime you need to rip a bunch of boards down to length, uh, rip a bunch of boards down to, to width. Um, I don't know if I would have a chop saw uh, because most of the time it's just easier to cut it by hand. Um, and for those few times where I need to cut a bunch of things, I'd probably have a circular saw and cut them roughly and then bring them back to, to close to finish. But for all the joinery, 99% um, you, of what I do, you, you can't beat hand tools um, for, for the speed even. Because most of the time you're doing, you know, four sides of a box, um, and the amount of time it takes up to set up the tools to do it, I can I can have the tools out here and, and cut it by hand and eye and, and be done with it. Um, and so I, I would probably be solidly hybrid, um, but yeah, there are, there are some things that it's just it's easier to do than quick and easy and have it done, like cutting 80 feet of two inch thick red oak. That was a really fun day. <laughs> um, I think you touched on this earlier, but I don't know that Joe R was on the chat at that point of when should we expect the results for round two of your glue tests? Um, probably two to three more weeks. Um, I think it's going to take me that long to get through it. I have, I have to, well, I've, I've glued on all the blocks now and now they're all in either the exterior testing or in the process of breaking them off. Um, and it's 1,200 blocks um, that have to be glued on and broken off. And so all told with the entire test, it'll be 2,400 blocks that have been tested. So an incredible amount of data points, but that also means an incredible amount of work. Um, so yeah, um, all told in this, this glue project is probably somewhere around $1,500 that I've put into the supplies and projects on it. Um, and probably getting close to around 200 hours worth of uh, actual work on it. So lots of fun, but it, it'll be another couple weeks until this step is out. 
I think we have time for a couple more questions. All right. I was trying to figure out how. So if we haven't gotten to your question, either throw up a super chat or we'll see you next time. Um, Dr. Kanihuchima, when do you buy an anvil and start some basic foraging to make your own blade slash irons? Uh, yes, that will happen someday. Um, I want to build an outdoor shop. And that would be a, a great way to have onto it, uh, to build like an awning with, uh, with a couple sides and do some blacksmithing outside. That, that would be, yeah, that, that it's high on my list to do someday. Um, but uh, a lot of things are high on my list. <laughs> so someday I will be doing something like that. Let's do one more. All right. Um, Matt Robin asked, do you have a shooting board? I do have a shooting board. Um, I have a video on making a shooting board. Uh, actually, two different videos on making shooting boards. And this one even has a track that the, the plane will run in. Um, I don't use it much because most of the time I actually find it quicker and easier to set the board in the vise and clean off the end by hand. Um, and I find that a very enjoyable method. I, I haven't found the shooting board to be as enjoyable, so that's why I generally don't use it much. Um, but Everyone's older. Um, so I think that is about it. If I didn't get to your question, feel free to send me an email. Um, I'll try and get to as many as I can on there. And we will see you next week. Oh, oh, I've got, I've got a joke. I needed to say one since no one super chatted. The joke is, what do you call a lady who is standing in the middle of a tennis court? Annette. <laughs> Is that the joke you were so proud of when it oh, came yeah, down? Oh, a great one. I love that one. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> on that, I uh, hope you have a good week. And until next time. I'm not even ready for the button. Hang on. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> Bye.